I will be talking today about my own spiritual search and what I've found for myself. This is different from what is commonly thought, though it is shared by small groups within all major religions. The main part of this talk focuses on things that we all experience every day in our everyday life, not some faraway deity to worship or ancient book to believe in, but what we experience ourselves each day. The talk is based on the shortest of the Hindu Upanishads, the Mandukya Upanishad. Now, I've been interested in Eastern wisdom most of my life, starting with Chinese Buddhism in my early 20s. Then, after 25 years, Indian ideas, ideas that are actually pretty radical to most people, even Indians. Uh, this is called Advaita Vedanta the teaching of non-duality expressed in the writings of Ramana Maharshi, an Indian sage of the last century. Starting about 1990 in Santa Cruz, California, Carol and I spent 15 years listening to a rare person, a real enlightened sage who called himself Nomi, no me, get it? What we learned was what Ramana taught and we were taught a form of meditation called self-inquiry that leads to deep discoveries about yourself and leads to more happiness every day. Now, these are pictures of my teacher and his teacher, Ramana Maharshi, you can probably figure out who is who. Now, I have become familiar with a few Hindu Upanishads. Let me put these into context. The oldest books in Hinduism are the Vedas. They date back as books 3,500 years and in verbal traditions much older. The Vedas have formulas for priests to conduct rituals. Ritual worship was only done by this priestly caste, the Brahmins. This is similar to Christianity and the long period where the Catholic Church was dominant and worship in mass could only be done by male priests. After a thousand years or so, both in India and in Europe, there was a spiritual revolution that had at its core the idea that people could know for themselves without these priests. Pretty radical thinking. In Europe, this began with the Reformation, started by who was at the time a radical heretic, Martin Luther. And uh, it was accelerated with the printing of Bibles in English so ordinary people could read it. Along the way, the idea that people could know for themselves bloomed into a new form, the Unitarians. This is our heritage. We feel that we can know for ourselves. This is a key element in the fourth principle of free and responsible search for truth and meaning. In India, this revolution came in the form of the Upanishads, literally meaning sitting down beside. This is with a teacher, not a priest, and learning directly from him. 
the Upanishads are a collection of ancient Sanskrit texts that contain some of the central philosophical ideas of Hinduism. They were composed about 3,000 years ago. Each came from a teacher, a person who had done long spiritual practices, maybe yoga and meditation, and found deep understanding of themselves and the world. These Upanishads are a collection not of some special knowledge that came from high, but rather the actual experience and collected wisdom of real people. The form of teaching then was to go and sit with the teacher, listening to them, talking, asking questions, and learning spiritual practices. Thus the name Upanishads, a sitting down beside. Now today, I'm going to use the shortest of these Upanishads, the Mandukya Upanishads, to talk about. Now this is one of the most important and widely studied texts. It's often interpreted as a treatise on the nature of consciousness and ultimate reality. The basic idea is not hard. One way to say it is the universe and you are the same, not two different things. What a radical idea. The distinctions and separations that we perceive between ourselves and people, things and events are in this view, ultimately illusory, just an appearance within the ultimate reality. They just appear, the ultimate reality stays the same. In reality, there are no differences. The key is that you can experience this directly for yourself. It's not something you have to believe in. You can experience it directly. And these ideas challenge our conventional way of thinking about the world and our place in it. These teachings provide a way to experience what is written not to just understand it with your mind or believe in it. The ancient approach is listen or read, reflect, and then deeply meditate. Meditation moves the teaching from intellectual to experiential. The Mandukya Upanishad has only 12 verses, and I'm only going to talk about a few of them here today. The first verse explains why we have heard all these ohms. It turns out that ohm stands for everything that is. This, the past, the present and the future are all OM. OM is really three letters, AH, U, and M. The silence after the OM is also part of the word. The silence is the consciousness within you that knows everything. This includes the AH, the U and the M. Now, the second verse expresses the basic teaching of the Upanishads that there is one reality and you are that reality. They call this universal reality Brahman and many other names. They call you the individual. Atman, and they say Atman is Brahman. 
no difference. Atman is also called the self. That's self with a capital S to differentiate it from the individual ego idea of self with a small s. You are not different from the universal reality. Atman is Brahman, no difference. This is a simple idea, but profound in its implications. The teachings and practices have as their purpose for you to directly experience non-difference. The problems in our life, they say, come from the fact that we really don't know ourselves as this universal reality. Instead, we think our body and our ideas are reality. That we are separate beings acting in a separate world. The message of the Upanishads challenges this and say, know yourself, not just the surface ideas of identity, but the deep current in which these ideas float and drift, appear and disappear. The ideas come and go, but the reality is always there. The Mandukya gives a way to analyze and see yourself more deeply. The next verses give an explanation of our reality as we experience it every day. When you look at yourself, you see four aspects. Three are well known, experienced every day by everyone. They are waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. In addition to these three states, there is said to be a less well-known fourth aspect, which knows each of these three states. When waking, you might remember your dream or know that you had a good sleep. So some knowing element must connect these three states. That is the fourth. It is called Turiya. Now, the fourth is not really another state since it is active all the time during the first three, and it knows all three. The fourth is the reality that is always there the awareness that is always knowing. Understanding the first three states gives you a doorway into the fourth. We have a waking state, a dream state, and a deep sleep state. These are all known by the fourth. Now, the waking state. Everybody primarily views themselves as a waker in the waking state. This is what you call your life. This is what you think of as your identity. Here I am. I am this body. And here is my world. Since I am this body, with all its attributes and its attributes and activities are mine too. So I say, I am a 79 year old man, a husband, father, son, standing in front of you today. I'm from Silicon Valley and I was born in Oklahoma and so on. We have all these stories we think we're the star of. When I say I, when I say me, I'm referring to myself as a waking state entity. The belief is that I am a waker. It's only a belief. 
it comes with the conviction that the waking state, physical, emotional, and intellectual objects are reality. The waking state is reality, or so we think. The waker's consciousness is turned outward. The self, the Atman, is unnoticed as it shines through the senses, mind, and intellect, and illuminates their objects. The waker is a consumer of experience. There is a basic subject-object orientation with a primary orientation and mental focus around the subject, the ego I. The subject is full of ideas and the ego I desires experiences it thinks will make it feel whole, adequate, and happy. This ego I is just an assumption made early in life and never challenge the mind and the is oriented around this ego I and its view of the world is based on the idea of the ego I. So now the dream state, the dreamer with consciousness turned inward experiences a dream world. It seems real. It's only seen as a dream when you reflect back on it from the waking state. The dream world is similar in many ways to the waking state world, and it can be radically different in others. Like the waker, the dreamer believes they and their world are real with the same subject object orientation. They have a history in their dream world and plans for their dream future. The dreamer is equipped with the same instruments for experience as the waker and, and a dream ego who is the star of the dream and experiences the dream life. The dreams are entirely the projection of mind based on habits, tendencies, and imagination. Dreams appear in consciousness even though the waking senses are inactive. The body is inert though the mind is active. The dream is playing on the screen of awareness like a movie. Even though the physical world is absent and the eyes are closed, the dream ego, the dream world, and the events in which it is participating are all shown in the movie and they all seem real. So now, deep sleep. Deep sleep is the state where you lose awareness and your mind becomes inactive. Deep sleep is full of happiness. Everybody says, I had a good sleep. You don't desire any external objects. You don't see any internal objects. The inactive mind retains no memories. It is not the absence of consciousness, but rather consciousness of absence. That's a different way to look. We know the sleeper's experience though, Everyone reports a good or bad sleep after they wake and transform into a waker. We're not really a sleeper, but actually we are the fourth. Otherwise, there would not even be the knowledge I slept well. 
deep sleep is sometimes called the seed state because our waking and dream worlds emerge from it when we wake. Now, finally, the fourth. What is the common factor in all these three states? Though they seem so, the three selves are not actually separate entities, but only apparently distinct, created when you associate yourself with a given state of mind, of consciousness. These three states and their egos are known to everyone and constitute the totality of the ego eyes experience, the self with a lowercase s. If you were looking for the big S self, after a while, you start to see that it is always present. It is always there as the awareness of everything else. Everything else is constantly changing in the reality in which everything appears. You wonder, how can I be something that comes and goes? I don't come and go. Do you come and go? When you examine the three states, you see that everything in each of them comes and goes. This points to the fourth, which is always here and knows each of these three states. What is always there within you? What is the same now as in your oldest memory? It takes a kind of courage to look at these things this way and to ask these kinds of questions. It can give you a new way of looking at yourself, observing things you never noticed before. Some of these might be habits, internal conditionings that hold you back, that limit your experiences. These limit your happiness too. Until you notice them, these habits fill your life and limit your sense of aliveness. When you start to observe them in action, you can stop them and make another choice. Turn a negative habit into a positive habit or just release it. When you change yourself, the world changes too. How we see the world depends on how we see ourself. Want to change the world? Change yourself. Here from the verse of the Mandukya Upanishad on the fourth, Invisible, otherworldly, incomprehensible, without qualities, beyond all thoughts, indescribable, the unified in essence, peaceful, auspicious, without duality, is the fourth stage, that self, that is to be realized. What is being said here is about you. This is what you are when the small elf S self gets out of the way. This is pure consciousness, consciousness without an object. You are not the waker, not the dreamer, not the sleeper. You are that which knows them all. Notice that the quote says, that is to be realized. It's not talking about mental cognitive knowing. 
is talking about experiential realization at the same level that you know that you exist without sensing it or thinking about it. You just know. We know the world of objects. Consciousness, though, is not an object. The consciousness witnessing these objects is the essential ingredient. Without this consciousness, the rays of light illuminating the objects are not known. The actual light is not essential to the perception. Consciousness is, though, without the consciousness, nothing is experience. Consciousness is what is essential. Consciousness is the fourth. Now about spiritual practice. The point of spiritual practice of meditation is to turn this teaching into your own experience, not so much to give you new ideas, but to know it from deep within. I went to Est about 50 years ago, and Warner Earhart said, understanding is the booby prize. Ramana Maharshi said that practice is more akin to feeling than thinking. They're talking about making it experiential rather than cognitive. Intuitive instead of rational. In meditation, you can learn to quiet your mind until finally it gets so quiet that this internal knowledge the intuition just shines. The Mandukya Upanishad provides a way to do this based on your own experience. It doesn't require any theological belief, just your own observation of your daily life. So watch your waking, your dream, and your deep sleep and see what they all have in common. It's not the things, it's not your idea of yourself, it's not your dream of yourself, not even the peace of deep sleep. What knows all of these three? What is common to all of these three? What is always there, whether I notice it or not? Watch and notice. How can who you are be different from what is always there? Ramana Maharshi says the key to practice is to hold this sense of I. Finally, the other ideas of yourself just fall away. This practice is not for everyone. It can be challenging and requires a certain level of commitment and dedication. However, it can be a powerful means of personal growth and spiritual realization for those who are willing to undertake it. You know the three states. You experience them every day. Now, get to know the fourth. Now, our closing words today are from Atma Bodhi by Adi Shankara. By negating conditionings with the knowledge, I am not this, realize your identity as the self, as indicated in scripture. The three bodies are perceived objects and is perishable as bubbles. Realize through pure discrimination, I am not them. I am the infinite, non-dual, pure consciousness. Because I am other than the body, I don't suffer its changes. I am not born, nor do I die. 
because I am other than the mind, I am free from sorrow, attachment, malice, and fear. Scripture says I am pure without thought and desire. And so I am. I am eternal, formless, and ever free. I am the same in all, filling all things with being. I am infinite, non-dual, pure consciousness. <laughs> 